Collisions and momentum, so important. What I really like about this problem that they've introduced where there's a magnet at rest and another magnet that's attracted to it, slamming into it, is that the magnets actually do work on one another. So this magnet right here that's at rest when the other one's zooming into it is actually gonna be drawn to the left and the one that's going to the right is going to be accelerating as they slam into each other. But the cool thing is, I think we can neglect that motion entirely because it doesn't affect the system as a whole. It's a leftward force on the right one and a rightward force on the left one. Anyway, uh, I'm asking you to investigate in this first problem um, how much energy is lost. Because yeah, they're going to end up moving together at two meters per second. But I'm looking for a fraction of the energy that's lost. How does this compare to the initial energy? You can present it as a fraction. And the next problem is carrying along the same idea. We've still got the four meter per second initial motion, but the moving magnet, 22 grams, hits a magnet that's much more massive, three times its mass. So that means that initially one quarter of the mass is moving and three quarters of it is at rest. I'm looking to try to find what fraction of the energy is lost. And this next problem uh, is another variation on the same theme. You've got a 22 gram magnet moving and a 2.2 gram magnet at rest. So now 11, 10 elevenths of the mass is moving and 1 eleventh of the mass is stationary. And these discussions, this tweaking the ratio thing, is part of a physics attitude I'd like you to develop called um, investigating the limits. I'm trying out different relationships. Ultimately, you might also ask, what if a million grams hits a single gram at rest? Or what if one gram moving hits a million grams at rest? Those kinds of relationships are the relationships that teach us a lot about a problem, um, investigating those outer fringes, as physicists we call them, the limits. Okay, next problem is uh, about uh, really about the center of mass equation because it's kind of weird how mathematically it works. So I'm asking you to explain why the number gets smaller if we don't actually add anything to the fraction. Um, yeah, see if you can work yourself through that. See if mathematically you can make some sense out of that equation. The problem number five is about um, uh, well, it's actually an anti-collision. When things move apart from each other, they are anti-colliding. And it's actually like an anti, um, it's like a collision back in time where they would stick. But instead, they start stuck and they shoot apart from each other. This problem and uh, the final problem are uh, examples of this type of problem. So it's actually an inverse, perfectly inelastic collision, uh, working backwards in time. That's what I mean by inverse. Anyway, this explains the effect of recoil. And when you fire a crossbow, <laughs> the crossbow pushes back into your shoulder, I suppose. But if you hold it loosely, then the crossbow initially has some velocity back at your shoulder and that's what I'm looking to find now the reason that you don't notice it for instance uh, let's think about a cannon if you have a cannon that cannon is has this little post of wood that goes down into the ground and the cannons facing this way <clears throat> so you fire the cannonball this way and the cannon tries to go back this way and kill you and the post of ground uh, the post of wood is into the ground so it can't actually go back all right, recoil. We'll explore that conceptually a little bit. And uh, credit to Jim Gaffigan for the idea, but in this case, you're celebrating you're celebrating the end of your marathon and someone hands you a baby. So what happens? Do you speed up? Do you slow down? Uh, this is traditionally given as rain falling into an open um, um, an open cart kind of problem, uh, train tracks, whatnot. But anyway, we're catching babies, so figure out what happens. Yes, yes, that's what we're doing. Um, this is a doozy of a problem and it's bonus. But I wanted to say to you, if you're just studying physics for the first time, you don't need to panic when somebody says nuclear decay or nuclear physics because the principles that we're learning right now of energy and momentum apply to situations like this as well. It's actually really cool that we can start talking about this already. So the problem goes like this. There's a very small atom with a mass 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. Wow, that's small. And there's another atom with a mass 10 to the negative 25th kilograms. Oh, sorry, kilograms, kilograms. Who edits these things? Dang it. Kilograms. Apparently nobody edits these things. All right, you've got a mass in kil... That doesn't look like kilograms at all. All right. It's supposed to be kilograms. 
and uh, we're trying to figure out what's happening. Now, one of them is going to fly off to the right with this energy, so what does the other one do? Question mark. And then I'm asking about the total energy released during the decay. So this is cool because if you know the energy of one of them flying off and you know the mass of both of them, you can actually figure out how much energy you can harness by causing nuclear decay or by allowing nuclear decay and capturing that energy. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's 209 bismuth. Let me tell you a story about 209 bismuth. There are many tons of 209 bismuth still inside the crust of the Earth. And for a long time, it was thought that 209 bismuth was the heaviest stable isotope. It's not because it's not stable. But its decay rate is so incredibly slow that if you took all of the bismuth that's on Earth, all the bismuth that's in the crust, and you doubled the life of the universe, then the amount of bismuth that would have decayed is equal to the mass of a U.S. quarter. Dang. That's all the bismuth in the crust, many tons, and that's doubling the life of the universe. Holy cow.